Now we're going to go through the in the field constraints and the type of randomization you can implement in the field and in the lab as well. So you will have many opportunities to randomize, and you get to choose the level of randomization. It turns out that different levels of randomization implies, you know, different statistical power and analysis method. And you have to choose uh, which aspect of the program to randomize. So let's first talk about the opportunities to randomize. What can be randomized? There are lots of different things that can be randomized depending on what you want to learn. There are three basic elements of a program that can be randomized. The first one is access. So experimenters can choose which people are offered access to a program. The second aspect is timing. We can choose when people are offered access. And so we'll use the Uber tipping experiment, which is a real large scale experiment that they ran in the field before they introduced the tipping feature. And we'll also talk about what's called an encouragement design, which is experimenters can choose which people are given encouragement to participate in a program. And we'll, in this case, we'll talk about a postcard intervention by the University of Michigan Undergraduate Admissions Office. Let's take a look at some of the examples of what can be randomized. Let's say that an NGO wants to tackle obesity, but they're not sure what the program should look like. They can randomize on different aspects of the program design. They can offer multiple programs and randomize people into different programs. Sometimes you uh, have new services coming up. Let's say an insurance company wants to introduce new insurance product for farmers, and you want to evaluate how the new insurance product compared to the old ones. You can then randomize a subsample of the farmers to be exposed to the new insurance programs. Sometimes you get to have new people. So for example, Oregon has money to add more people to its Medicaid program and that would enable them to study the effect of having Medicaid on health outcomes. And you can infer causally what's the effect of access to Medicaid program if you design a randomized field experiment. Sometimes you get to have new locations. So for instance, microcredit company might want to expand to a new location. There that offers opportunities to randomize as well. Another opportunity to randomize is when there are oversubscriptions. So let's say more families sign up for education vouchers than the government can fund. In that case, you can randomly select a subset of the families who signed up to receive the education vouchers, and the other subset who are randomized out would serve as your control. Very exciting. Sometimes there are undersubscriptions. So for instance, lottery for conscription during the Vietnam War can be analyzed as a natural experiment. You might have communities taking turns hosting an event, and if the order is randomized, that enables you to evaluate the effect of the program. In some cases, when there are admission cutoffs, that offers an opportunity to randomize. For instance, scholarships has merit cutoff and the ability to randomize admissions just below and just above the cutoff. So instead of having a one hard cutoff, you can have a range, and that enables you to look at the effect of receiving merit scholarships. Uh, you can have admissions in phases, and that phased-in design also offers you opportunities to evaluate causal effects. Now we'll be talking about choosing the level of randomization. So the level of randomization can be at the individual level, or sometimes when you have, let's say, school lunch, suppose your budget is not sufficient to cover all students. You can randomly select, let's say, half of the students to receive free school lunch, and that, that's randomization at the individual level. Or you can have a cluster so for instance, instead of at the individual level, you can randomize at the class level. Some of the classes could be randomized into 
receiving an extra teacher in the classroom, and some are randomized without the extra teacher. That enables you to evaluate the effect of having an additional teacher in the classroom. Sometimes you might want to randomize at the school level. When would you want to do that? Um, it turns out that there might be spillovers when you randomize at the individual level. Let's go back to the school lunch program. Let's say you randomize half of the students into receiving free school lunch and the other half are randomized into the control condition. During lunchtime, you cannot prevent kids from sharing their free lunch with their friends, which means that your data is actually contaminated. Some of your children in the control condition also receive treatments because their friends share school lunch with them. And sometimes for political or logistic reasons, you have to randomize at a higher level, for instance, at the school level. Here are some considerations for the level of randomization. You, you might be worried about the unit of measurements. Uh, usually, a, a larger clusters would reduce your statistical power. You might be worried about feasibility and fairness. So for instance, if one class receives additional teachers, another one doesn't, parents might feel that that's unfair, that their children might be disadvantaged. In that case, you might want to randomize at the school level. Sometimes you might worry about spillovers, just as we talked about in the school lunch example. Treated children might want to share their school lunch with the uh, control group children. In that case, you don't have a clear separation of the treated and the control group. You might have attrition or compliance issues. And as we will develop later, that there are implications for statistical power. When you randomize at a lower level, such as an individual level, you typically have higher statistical power compared to, let's say, at the school level and sometimes you have to cluster on the ground. And the next aspect that we're going to talk about is to decide which aspect of the program to randomize. Uh, we will talk about five very practical research designs of randomization. So we mentioned three different aspects, access, timing, and encouragement. Access, which is who are offered access to a program, we'll talk about two different designs. One is called the treatment lottery, the second one is called the treatment lottery around cutoff. We'll then talk about two designs for timing. One is called face in, the other one is called rotation. And the last one, the fifth research design that we'll mention is the encouragement design, which is which people are given encouragement to participate. So the first research design we'll talk about is the treatment lottery. So when do you want to run a treatment lottery? That's when there are limited access and oversubscription. And you also want to measure the effect in the long run. So for instance, Kenya wants to assign extra teachers to some of the schools. There are only 120 extra teachers, but 210 uh, schools. And so you want to, in this case, run a lottery and you know the blue dots are the schools which are randomized into receiving the, the treatment, which is the extra teachers, whereas the comparison group or the control group, sometimes we use this interchangeably, are randomized into you know, having the same teachers, number of teachers as before. The second type of research design is called treatment lottery around cutoff. So for instance, for merit scholarships, you might have a cutoff score, and everyone above the score uh, is accepted into the program, whereas everyone below is rejected. Sometimes you also have centralized college admissions using standardized tests, which also has similar features. So the question is, if you want to evaluate what is the effect of the merit scholarship on student outcomes, you won't be able to answer that using naturally occurring data because people who are accepted have systematic different characteristics than people who are rejected. And these are, you know, confounds, confounders. However, as a researcher, if this is feasible, you can instead generate a lottery zone, okay? 
So among the people who are rejected, for instance, based on the score, you can set a lottery zone. So everybody inside the lottery zone can be randomized into being accepted or being rejected. That means you know you can have a larger lottery zone or a smaller lottery zone, and you can have a lottery zone among the accepted students as well. This will enable you to study the effect of the merit scholarship on student outcomes by comparing those in the lottery zone. These are people who are roughly similar in terms of their scores. But some some of them are randomly assigned to receiving the scholarship, whereas others are randomized into not receiving the scholarship. So the comparison of this group will enable you to say something about the effects of the merit scholarship on student outcomes. The third research design is called a facing design. When can you run this type of research design? That's when everyone. Is given access eventually, but not at once. So the average program impact can be evaluated during different periods. However, if everyone knows that the treatment is coming, the anticipation might dilute your effects. So the time to effect should be shorter than the treatment period. So here's an example of a facing design. So in year one. Block A is treated randomly. A randomly selected block A is treated, so you can compare the outcomes of those in B, C with A. That will give you the one-year effect. In the second year, then you face block B into the treatment. Then comparing, you know, C with A will give you the effect after the program has been run for two years, where the comparison between C and B. Will give you the effect of you know one year, and then in year three, everyone receives treatment. So that type of facing design enables you to study what's the effect of receiving treatment for one year, what's the effect of receiving treatments for two years, and so on. And it's still fair, broadly speaking, because eventually everybody receives treatment. There's a recent implementation of the facing design at the ride-sharing platform Uber. So the subsequent content is from a working paper called "Evaluating Market Outcomes in a Nationwide Experiment on Tipping: Evidence from Uber." The slides is from Bharat Chanda. So some of you might recall that when ride-sharing first became implemented, the two dominant Ride-sharing platforms, Uber and Lyft, have somewhat different features. On Lyft, if you download the Lyft app, it allows the rider to tip the driver. Whereas initially on the Uber app, you don't even have the feature to tip the driver. In summer 2017, Uber decided to enable the riders to tip the、um, the drivers. However, they decided instead of just you know adding it to every driver and every rider's app, they decided to use a facing design. And so they were interested in whether tipping affects labor supply, and whether it affects demand. Does it affect driver earnings and the quality of service? So this experiment was fairly large scale. It、um, was implemented across. 209 operating cities in the U.S. and Canada in July 2017, but they rolled out this feature in two phases. On July 6, about half of the cities on Uber were given the option to tip, and the feature was fully rolled out on July 17th. In other words, the half of the cities that were given access later can serve as the control group for the cities that were given access earlier. And the key feature here is that cities were randomized into receiving the tipping feature earlier versus later, and they use what's called a randomized block design. So cities were matched into pairs, and in each pair, one of them were randomized into early, the other one was randomized into later. So altogether, there are eight hundred and fifteen thousand drivers across two hundred and nine cities.
Among those cities, 110 cities were randomized into treatments, receiving the treatments earlier. You know, we'll come back to this experiment when we talk about block design and, and cluster randomization, because this is an interesting field experiment that uses both features. The remaining cities were randomly assigned to treatment or control, so there, there are altogether 105 control cities and 104 treated cities. When you finish your randomization, what you should do is conduct a randomization check or a balancedness check, which says the idea of randomization is to make sure that you generate two samples, a treatment sample and a control sample, which are statistically indistinguishable. And can you check that? Yes, you can actually check it. So in this Uber experiment, the researchers checked whether their randomization worked. So did randomization work? So they presented a table essentially describing the degree of similarity between the treatment and the control groups in terms of the covariates. You can list the mean or other moments for each covariate and look at whether the covariates are balanced or not. And if they're not, that can also help foreshadow whether the covariate adjustment is likely to change the estimated average treatment effects. So we can present it in many different ways. This is looking at the time series of mean minutes worked among the control cities. So the control cities are in red and the treatment cities are in blue. The data is from June to July, and you can observe that they pretty much follow each other day by day. They, from eyeballing, they look pretty similar, but you should really look at the, uh, whether they are similar statistically. So here are two tables which check for randomization both at the individual level and at the city level. So at the individual level, which is the upper table, the researchers present t-tests for equality of means across individuals in the period before the tipping feature is launched. So we can look at whether they are significant or not. So for instance, in terms of the number of minutes worked, the average of you know, control group drivers worked 653.5 minutes, whereas the average treated drivers worked on average 682.6 minutes. And if you look at the T statistics, they're not significantly different. So the p-value is 0.66. And you can check other features. The bottom line is if you look at the p-value for equalities of means test, none of the features is significant, which says that the randomization worked at the individual level. The bottom table looks at whether randomization worked at the city level, whether the cities are balanced. Uh, you can also look at qualities of means tests by looking at t-test statistics. And in this case, two of the measures, minutes worked and probability of working, are not significantly different between the control cities versus the treated cities. But the minute worked conditional on working is different. Um, the average treated cities actually has higher number of minutes worked conditional on working. Even though they were careful in their randomization, exposed some of the features might still be different. And so when you run your experiments after randomization, that's the first thing you should do, and that's what you should report, which is to look at a set of balancedness tests or randomization check. So you might be wondering, you know, what is the effect of this large-scale field experiment using a facing design? It turns out that none of the metrics they use to measure demand, supply, hourly earnings is significant. Um, so it can happen, you know, it is a large experiment, but they also use clustered random assignment, which is the random unit of randomization is at the city level rather than the individual level. We might want to think about why do they randomize at the city level? 
One speculation is that they might be worried about spillover effects. So suppose I'm an Uber driver and my neighbor is also an Uber driver. I'm treated, so I look at my app and say, oh, you know, I can receive tips. When I talk to my neighbor, my neighbor say, oh, is that right? Mine doesn't have this feature. So you might have spillover effects and um, other issues from the spillover. So it is a cleaner uh, experiment designed to randomize at the city level. However, it does reduce the statistical power of the experiment. So as a result, the confidence intervals in their estimates are very large, which leads to sort of none of the metrics actually are different across the treatment and the control group. Now we're going to discuss a fourth design option, which is rotation. So when would you use a rotation design? This is when you have limited resources that everyone needs, and you're not expected to have an increase in these resources. And the effects only happens during the time of the experiment. So let's take a look and see how the rotation, uh, rotation design works. So this example is from a remedial education program in India. So we have a limited number of tutors. So in year one, grade three, so you have two schools, school A and school B. In year one, among third grade students, uh, school A receives tutor, where school B does not receive tutors. Uh, in this case, you can look at the difference between school A and school B to look at the effects of receiving extra tutors on student outcomes among third graders. And with grade, the fourth graders, we can rotate. We can have, you know, treat school B and not school A. In year two, we can now, for instance, in school A, we can treat grade four and withdraw the tutors from grade three. Whereas in school B, you know, now in year two, grade three students get treated and the fourth graders do not get extra tutors. So you will have multiple control groups, you know, within the same grade across schools and within schools across grades to look at the effect of tutoring. And if you compare school A's second year outcome with school B's second year outcome among fourth graders, you can look at the impact of tutoring for two years. And the last one that we're going to discuss is called the encouragement design. This is when usually the program is open to everyone, but they're undersubscribed. So in that case, you can uh, encourage some students or some participants. For instance, their, their retirement savings program at American University, uh, but not everyone takes advantage of that. In that case, you can offer subsidies to people who attend information fair, an information fair, and that serves as an encouragement for participation. And the subsidies can be offered to a random subset of people that gives you a way to analyze the causal effect of information intervention and subsequent retirement savings outcome. I'm going to use uh, an experiment conducted by Professor Sue Dynarski at the University of Michigan. So Professor Dynarski worked with the undergraduate admissions office to essentially use targeted encouragement to, you know, she combines encouragement to apply to the University of Michigan with the promise of free tuition. The experimental design is implemented through sending postcards to some high-income students. So the empirical observation is that high-achieving, low-income students typically do not even apply for select colleges, lots of times because they're not aware of the generous financial aid packages. So the researchers target these students by sending postcards to these students, and they encourage students to apply with a promise of free tuition. What they find is that students who, are, who receive postcards, you know, those who receive postcards are under the encouragement, they're more than twice as likely to apply to the University of Michigan, and once accepted, they're more than twice as likely to enroll. 
So if you look at those students who enroll, they would have attended a less selective college, a community college, or not attending college at all. How do we know that? We look at those who are in the control group because the, uh, they, there are a group of students in the control group who are statistically equivalent in every dimension that we can observe. Let me summarize all we have just covered. Um, so there are many different ways to randomize. As a researcher, you get to choose what aspect of a program to randomize, when to randomize, and how to do the randomization. There are two different ways of randomization. One is called simple, the other one is called complete randomization. And we went through five common designs of randomization. 